And before I jump into that, children, if you want to go with Pastor Michelle downstairs for your class, you are more than welcome to join her or stay here as well. But right now, children are dismissed. So we're, well, that's very echoey. So we're coming towards the end of our um, study in Hebrews, and we're on chapter 12. And I titled this, Staying in the Race. We had raced before. Yeah, okay, so you, you know the competition. You know how much work it takes, right? How much discipline it takes. But let me ask you this other question. How many of you have started a project with great motivation, and then somewhere along the line, you just wanted to quit. Hey, we can all relate, right? What often, what's like some of the things that make you want to quit? Obstacles, yes. What else? Fear, exhaustion, tiredness. What else? Failures. Difficulty. Having ADHD. Having ADHD, yeah, that too, right? You start many projects. Messing up. Adversaries, yeah. Huh? Something else comes up, right? The unexpected. Bad influences. Huh? Exhaustion, tiredness. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Laziness, absolutely. <laughs> Laziness will make you want to quit, right? So you know these things. But now let me reverse that question and ask you, right? I know many of you have started something and finished something. We're here, right? So then the question has a two sides to it. What makes you go on? What makes you not want to quit? What makes you say, no, I can do this? Like, what causes that? Encouragement, yes. Faith and hope, yes. Ah, okay, there you go. <laughs> yes. Good. Amen. Identity, yes, Bob. Love. The reward waiting, yes. We have other witnesses, right? Good, okay. What else? Patience. Patience? Yeah, lots of it. Good. Children? Oh, yeah. People? Just as people can be adversaries, people can also be the cause that you stay in the race, right? These are all good answers, and I, and I really appreciate it. But I want you to notice something, that in, within all those answers, at the end of the day, whether you go or whether you quit, the decision lies on who? On me. I can have all these factors surround me, all these causes, all these things, all these excuses, or all these good things, right? But at the end of the day, who makes the decision? I do. Whether I go or whether I quit. When you are running a marathon, which is about 26 miles or so, and you are on, on mile 20, right? At that point, you are pretty sure why you are in that marathon to begin with. You don't reach mile 20 and say, oh, I wonder why I'm here. No, you know, right? And you are, you are confident that you're going to finish. 99% of marathon runners finish the race. 99%, right? Because these people already go with this mindset that what? That when I step into this race, I am going to what? Finish. Some of these pe people finish crawling. And it doesn't matter. It's the idea that they finish the marathon. And for some of them, it's not about the time. It's about I did it. I ran the race. Some take five hours, and then some take 10 hours, and some take longer than that. But 99% of those who say, I'm going to run a marathon, finish the race. And it's not just because they one day say, oh, you know what, I'm going to run a marathon one day, and then pick the closest, you know, the, the next marathon and say, all right, tie your shoelace and go. No. What does it take to run a marathon? Training. 
And right now, you would say, all right, man, he looks fit, you know. He could probably run 26 miles. It's like, no way, I could not, <laughs> right? There would be no way I would have to train for months to be able to let my body adapt to that long pace, that long journey. The author, it's interesting, illustrates our life of discipleship to that of a race, but I think more to that of a marathon. And we better know why we're in it. We better know why we're in it. We all started well. You were excited the moment that you accepted Jesus in your life. You were excited for this new creation, for this change, for this, and you were motivated and zealous. But some are on mile one, and some are on mile 20. And as the race went on, opposition grew, challenges grew, temptations grew. And suddenly, you feel like you are in a hurdle race. I have one picture right there to show you. Yeah, okay? So when I say race, you're in a race, none of you ever imagine hurdles in your race, right? It's just, I mean, you would be crazy to think, oh yeah, race, hurdles. No, you usually think of a flat race. But the reality is that when we think of race, when it comes to this Christian discipleship, there's hurdles. For some of us, it may look like that. For others, it may look like that. How fun would that be, trying to run over those things, right? And it depends for each one of us. Those hurdles, though, you have to understand, they don't alter the course of that race. They don't alter the course of that race. Nevertheless, right, they're there. And they tend to slow you down or make you fall or even discourage you. Just by looking at that, do you want to run? It's like, no, I just want to knock them off and then fall like dominoes. Right? But they're not that close together. But it's just discouraging when you just see hurdle after hurdle in your life. But in the end, even with hurdles, it comes down to you. Whether you say, yes, I'm going to keep running, or no, I quit. God hopes you stay in the race. The author of Hebrew hopes you stay in the race. I hope you stay in the race. You see, Hebrews 12 is not concerned about, hey, who put those hurdles? Well, I'll let you know who put those hurdles, right? And I'll let you know who created those hurdles, and I'll let you know why those hurdles are there. Hebrews 12 is not about explaining how those hurdles got there and why they're there and who's responsible for those hurdles. Hebrews chapter 12 is different. Hebrews chapter 12 is concerned about the attitude. The attitude being in the right place and able to overcome those hurdles and finish the race strong. It's very different. So this is what Hebrews 12, 3 and 7 said. It says, think about the one who endured such a position from sinners so that you won't be discouraged and you won't give up. It's talking about Jesus. If you look at Jesus' race, I'm pretty sure we can see many hurdles that he had to jump over. In your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted yet to the point of shedding blood. And you have forgotten the encouragement that addresses you as sons and daughters. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline or give up when you are corrected by him because the Lord disciplines whomever he loves and he punishes every son or daughter whom he accepts. Bear hardship for the sake of discipline. Bear hardship for the sake of discipline. Let me put it this way. It's common, I have three boys, right? It's common when children are being disciplined, like when I discipline my children, right? Sometimes one of the words that they say is, Daddy hates me, <laughs> right? Or Daddy doesn't like me, right? It's like, why is he being so disciplined? Or why is he being so rough? Or why is he being so stern, right? And you have to understand, though, that discipline is not complete until there's a conversation about what went wrong and finish with this affirmation of, hey, you are still loved by me. It's very damaging when you just give people consequences, but then don't explain why, and then don't reassure them, hey, nothing has changed. I still love you. That's the correct way of addressing discipline. But you have to understand, excuse me? If that works, yes. 
But you have to understand this. We are no longer children. We are no longer children to think that God must not love me because he disciplines me. We're no longer children. We know that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. The author invites us to shape our attitude so that when we do encounter discipline, when we do encounter hurdles, that it be not the cause for us to quit the race, but rather understand that it's there to make sure, hey, it's part of the race, that someone's there to make sure I finish the race and finish well. An attitude that helps us recognize that there's meaning, even among hurdles, there's meaning and purpose to all of it. Hebrews 12, 11 says this, no discipline is fun while it lasts. Nope, but it seems painful at the time. Yes. Later, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it, for those who stick through the discipline. As a loving father, you have to understand that God will not allow a rebellious heart and let it continue into this path of destruction. There's just no way. There's nothing greater in God's heart than to spend eternity with you, to see you finish the race, to give you joy as you run the race, to grant you contentment as you run the race. And you have to understand this very clearly. I don't believe that God will intentionally bring catastrophe and suffering into your life just to teach you discipline. As a father, and an earthly father, I would never want to say to my son, you know what, Micah? I am going to make sure you get into an accident on purpose so that you learn this lesson that I'm about to teach you. Can you imagine a father saying that? We just don't do that, right? It's like, how would we expect our Heavenly Father to do that? What I do believe, though, is that because of our own poor decision, have we made poor decisions? <laughs> yes. And not just our own, but because other people make poor decisions because we live in an imperfect world because we have an imperfect body guess what there are plenty of those situations to go around for everyone plenty what god will and can do is use those situations to grab your attention put things into perspective shape your attitude give you hope and see to it that you draw closer to god if we lose sight of God in the midst of all of that, if we lose sight of why we're even in that race or in that marathon, we can become very short-sighted. And all of a sudden, that temporal gratification, right, to quit and to go after something faster, a shortcut, blurs that finish line, and we lose sight of Jesus. And we end up disqualifying our own selves from that race. The author uses Jacob and Esau as an example. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Esau was a hunter and he went hunting all day. Jacob was more of a stay-home person, right? Esau comes back from hunting and he's very hungry and he sees his brother Jacob with a meal. And then he says, hey, I want some food. And Jacob says, well, sell me your birthright. And he's like, oh, sure, okay. <laughs> and he sells him his birthright for a simple what? For a simple meal. Hebrews 12, 16, 17 tells that story. It says, make sure that no one becomes sexually immoral or ungodly like Esau, who sold his inheritance as the oldest son for one meal. You know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected because he couldn't find a way to change his heart and life, though he looked for it with tears. Staying in the race won't be easy. For one, there are hurdles. Two, it will require discipline. The discipline to listen and be lovingly corrected. The discipline to get rid of sin that trips us up. The discipline to get rid of unnecessary baggage. The discipline to not judge but encourage one another. The discipline to change our attitude. The discipline to be humble and be held accountable. The discipline to train and strengthen our body, mind, and spirit as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 then goes on in 14 and 15 to say, Pursue the goal of peace along with everyone and holiness as well, because no one will see the Lord without it. Make sure that no one misses out on God's grace. Make sure that no root of bitterness grows up that might cause trouble and pollute many people. 
understand this as I close, that sometimes you can be a hurdle in someone's life. I know, right? Sometimes you can be a hurdle in someone's life. Hence, the word says, we pursue the goal of peace along with who? With everyone. The second part, we also have to understand that sometimes you can be a hurdle to your own self. You can set up your own hurdles, right? That's funny. But it says we pursue the goal of holiness as well. To be continually set apart to do God's will and not my own. God didn't bring us together as a family to create hurdles in each other's lives, right? God didn't bring you and rescue you so that you could create hurdles yourself in your own life. I believe God brought us together that we would help each other, stay faithful to God, and be the voice that says, hey, you're not alone. We can do this. Let's stay in the race. And I want you to practice that. I want you to tell your neighbor around you, right, or near you, tell that person, hey, you're not alone. You can do that right now. Say, hey, you're not alone. <laughs> tell them, we can do this. And then tell them, let's stay in the race. We can't run this on our own, right? There will be moments where I'm going to need your help. There will be moments where we're going to need each other's help. This race is a race that we are meant to finish together. And so let us do that. Let us do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us hope. Even when the race becomes hard and we see hurdles in our lives, one after another, there is such great comfort that it's not only you who walks alongside of us, but we have such community around us to also help us, to encourage us, to tell us that we're not alone, that we can do this, that we can stay in the race. Some of us have been in this race for quite a long time. Some of us have just started this race. Some of us don't even know if we want to get in this race. But Father God, I pray that together we would come to bring in all those experiences, to bring in all that wisdom, to bring in all that knowledge and encourage one another to finish well and to finish strong. So as the author calls us, Lord God, may the hurdles in front of us today not be the cause for us to quit right now. But I pray that we would overcome through your help and through the help of one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.